All right. So um, last week, if you remember in our Bible reading, we read the story in um, in First Kings 20 of uh, Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, uh, coming to attack uh, the king of Israel, Ahab. And as I read that story, a few thoughts came to my mind and I sort of jotted them down. And I thought I'd just share those with you today as we go through that story. So the title of my sermon is called Standing Up to Ben-Hadad. Standing Up to Ben-Hadad. Because I want to show you just some parallels um, with the war that we fight in our own sort of Christian life. And obviously there's the spiritual war against the enemies um, and to those that are like of the world. But there's also that internal war, isn't there? There's that internal war of the spirit and the flesh that we fight all the time. And unfortunately, not all of us are winning in that fight. Not all of us are winning in that fight. Some of us are winning, but it's something that we fight daily, isn't it? Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. You just hope that you're winning the war, you know, eventually. Uh, but you may not win every battle, you know, because we do end up sinning. I just want to start here in uh, James 1.13. Uh, so, so what I'm talking about tonight is just some principles that we can learn from this story in 1 Kings 20. And we'll go there in a moment um, in standing up to one of our greatest enemies, right, which is our our flesh. Now, sometimes when people sin and or they fall, or they, they get into sin, um, sometimes they have this idea that Satan made me do it. You know, like they might you know, be watching pornography or they might be, uh, you know, uh, lying at work or they might be lazy or they might be doing something. They might be fornicating, right? They might be dating somebody, uh, you know, that's not saved or they're, they're not married yet. And, you know, every time they, they meet up, they're doing things they shouldn't be doing. Whatever that sin is, there, there's a whole multitude of sins that our, uh, that our flesh can do. But sometimes people, instead of just realizing their sinful nature, they blame Satan. They say, well, it wasn't me, it was Satan that made me do it. But when we see in James 1.13, it says here in verse uh, 13, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So we know that when we do sin, it's not God that's tempting us. God doesn't tempt us with evil. Um, now, God does test people, right, to see whether they're faithful. But what it says here is that he does not tempt with evil. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So you see here, it's not necessarily that Satan is making you sin. It's your own desire. It's your own lust that is in you that is creating that desire to do wrong. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Um, I'll go to Romans 7. And uh, Paul in Romans 7 from verse 14 actually describes this inner struggle that happens between what Galatians describe. You know, it's the spirit lusteth against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. And these are the contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. Uh, Romans 7, 14, it says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. And look at how he describes this inner struggle. It's sometimes when you read through this, it's a bit of a tongue twister, you know, as he's uh, saying the things that he wants to do, but he doesn't. For that which I do, I allow not. So he's saying the things that he does, he actually would not ne necessarily permit in his life. For what I would, that do I not. So the things that he wants to do, he's not doing. But what I hate, that do I. So he hates things. He hates sin, but he's doing it anyway. If then I do that which I would not, so he's saying if I'm doing the things I don't want to do, I consent unto the law that it is good. Oh, if, if, I then, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So he's starting to realize here, no, when I sin, it's because I have this flesh that is sinful. That's the reason why I have sin. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. So you see here, in him he has this flesh, and this flesh doesn't do anything good, right? The flesh always sins, but yet there is something in him as a saved person that wants to do right. For to will is present with me, but sometimes how to do that which is good he is not able to. For the good that I would not, I do. For the good that I would, I do not. 
but the evil which I would not, that I do. So you see how there's this constant struggle that there are things that he wants to do that he's not doing, and there are things that he knows he shouldn't do, and he is doing it anyway. Now if I do that which I, that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. So even though he wants to do good, he knows that the spirit is in him to do good, that that evil is still there. So, you know, we talked about that. Uh, I can't remember if it was last week or a couple of weeks ago, where, you know, people that say that they don't sin anymore. I mean, not even Paul was to that point. Paul recognized that there was a sinful part of him that he was struggling to keep under control. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So see, in his inward man, the mind wants to obey God, but yet he sees this law in his members, in his flesh, and, and notice this, warring against the law of my mind. So you see here, there is a war that is happening between your spirit and your flesh that you are fighting daily. Every day you go to war to fight against this flesh, whether you realize it or not. And if you don't realize it, then you're probably losing that battle, right? If you don't, if you don't even know a war is going on, then obviously the enemy is going to get the better of you. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So those of us who are saved, now that we have the Spirit of God, it gives us the ability to overcome this flesh. When Whereas you're not saved, you cannot overcome it because that's all that is there. Your spirit is dead and your flesh is causing you to sin. Now let's go to 1 Kings because I want to go through this story and just show you a couple of parallels that I thought were interesting as we go through that. Um, I'm not going to read through it all, but as I read through it, Sorry, I will read through it all, but I won't read through it all and then go through it again just for sake of time. Um, but hopefully if you, you're familiar with the story, but as we go through it, I'll explain to you uh, what's, happening on, what's happening in this story. And I want to draw a few parallels on how we fight with our flesh and the, some of the tactics as well that the, this king of Syria is using. And it's almost similar to what we see when the flesh, uh, when we go to war with our flesh. So in 1 Kings 20, it says here, in Ben-Hadad... The king of Syria gathered all his hosts together and there were 30 and two kings with him in horses and chariots. And he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. Now, one thing I want to note in this verse here is that notice how many kings are with Ben-Hadad, right? He's going up against the king of Israel, which is one king, but he has 32 kings with him, right? So I guess 33 kings altogether, uh, the king of Syria with the 32 kings uh, that are with him. And one thing I just want to note there is generally sin is popular, isn't it? Sin is popular. Don't be surprised if, you know, you go to school, you know, you go to uni, you go to work, and the most ungodliest person at work or at school or at uni, they're generally the most popular person, aren't they? And, and not even, you know, in, in the workforce and at school, but, but sometimes even in churches, God forbid, that the ungodliest child or the ungodliest teenager or the ungodliest person that's there sometimes is the most popular uh, within a, a church that is not, uh, you know, uh, trying to walk in the Lord and trying to do what's right. You know, God forbid that that would ever be the case in this church. I mean, in, in, in a church, it should be righteousness that is popular, right? It should be people that are doing the right thing uh, is, is what people want to follow and pe what people want to emulate and, and the sort of people that you want to be around. But because we have the flesh and because it's so easy to walk in the flesh, don't be surprised when the things of the flesh are popular. You know, it's the people at work with the dirty jokes. It's the kids, you know, at school that, you know, are rebellious and, and don't talk the right way. You know, maybe they're sneaking pornography in school and sneaking drugs in school. They're the popular kids. Beware of that. Beware that sin is popular. And, and, and beware that generally it's going to be the crowd that are doing the wrong thing. So if you follow the crowd, you're going to be pulled away doing the wrong thing too. This is why bullies are always popular. You know, bullies at school or even bullies at work or wherever, they're always popular because they're, you know, they're always bullies because it's easy to be a bully when everyone's on your side. You know, it's easy to be a bully when um, you're popular uh, when the majority's on your side. And when you try to do right, generally you're going to be in the minority, right? 
You know, when you try when you try and do what's right, you're going to be in the minority, and you're going to have to stand up against um, the evil, uh, the sin that is in you. So, like here, you know, Ben Hadad, if he's representing what is wrong, you know, he's popular. He's got 32 kings. He's got the crowd on his side. He's got the numbers. He's got the abundance. Sometimes it's also the richest people are the most ungodliest people. You know, even if you think about, uh, you know, Bill Gates, when he's all into eugenics and trying to control people, trying to force vaccinate people, these people that are evil are also generally very rich as well. And he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. And he sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, into the city and said unto him, Thus saith Ben-Hadad, Thy silver and thy gold is mine, thy wives also and thy children, even the goodliest are mine. And the king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. So what's happening here? Ben-Hadad, the king of Assyria, is basically threatening you know, the king of Israel, saying, Hey, you know what? Everything you have is mine. I'm going to you know, take your gold and your silver, your wives and your children. And what does the king of Israel do? He just gives it all over. He says, hey, you know, my, my Lord, everything that I have is yours. He's saying, I am thine and all that I have. Now, how does this sort of apply in our spiritual life when we are fighting against, uh, you know, the flesh? Is that the flesh wants your possessions. The flesh wants to take control of your possessions and your family to serve it rather than serve God. Um, let's go to Matthew, uh, Matthew 6, verse 19. Uh, this, and this doesn't go to the chapters I necessarily want to go. Matthew 6. Uh, verse, uh, oh, why is he going to Mark? Come on. Matthew 6. And let's go down to uh, verse 19. It says here, lay, Jesus says here, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. But see, because if the flesh can take control of your possessions, if the flesh can take control of the things you hold dear, it's going to take control of you also. And if you give that up, just like the king of Israel, then it's going to control you. So think about the way you spend your money. We talked about this. Spend, the way you spend your money just for pleasuring yourself. Uh, you know, spending time uh, seeking more money for pleasure, you know, rather than spending your time uh, serving God. And even with your family, you know, do you want your children just to be successful, just so that they can make more money, just to continue that cycle? Or are you raising your children to serve God and to put God first and be godly? Um, let's go back to um, to First Kings. Let's see if I, there's a shortcut to get me back there. Um, let's see. Yeah. All right, let's continue. And the messengers came, uh, verse six, uh, verse five. And the messengers came again and said, "Thus speaketh Ben Hadad, saying." Although I have sent unto thee, saying, Thou shalt deliver me thy silver and thy gold and thy wives and thy children, yet I will send my servants unto thee tomorrow about this time, and they shall search thine house and the houses of thy servants, and it shall be that whatsoever is pleasant in thine eyes, they shall put it in their hand and take it away. So you see here that Ben-Hadad, first of all, he comes to the king of Israel and he says, you know what, I'm just going to take your gold and your silver, your wives and your children. And then the king of Israel says, all right, fine, take it. He gives in, right? Then Ben-Hadad, what does he then do? He then says, well, you know what, if it's going to be that easy to just take you know, anything you give me, you know what, I'm going to send my servants and they're just going to look around your palace and anything they find, whatever their eyes desire, that I'm going to take. So you see here, it's like the flesh. If you give the flesh an inch, the flesh, flesh is going to take a mile, right? You think you're just going to watch that one video and that's going to be the end of it, you know, that one pornographic video. Or you think you're going to do that one wrong thing or you think you're going to, you know, take that one drug or that one cigarette or whatever and you think that's going to be the end of it. No, eventually it keeps on taking until it wants to just take everything if you give in. Now let's continue. Look what happens here. Now, now the king of Israel actually wises up a bit, right? And he goes and seeks some counsel. 
Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Mark, I pray you, and see how this man seeketh mischief. For he sent unto me for my wives and for my children and for my silver and for my gold, and I denied him not. And all the elders and all the people said unto him, Hearken not unto him, nor consent. Wherefore he said unto the messengers of Ben-Hadad, Tell my lord the king, all that thou didst send for to thy servant at the first I will do, but this thing I may not do. And the messengers departed and brought him word again. So now the king of Israel is standing up to Ben-Hadad, right? Because if you give in to the flesh, the flesh just wants more and more and more. You have to eventually stand up and take a stand and decide to do what's right. And it's, it's, with, it's with anything, right? Now, with the king of Israel, he, he eventually stood up to Ben-Hadad, right? He stood up to Ben-Hadad and he says, enough is enough. He goes to the elders of the land and he actually seeks counsel. And one thing that we can learn from this is that counsel and fellowship gives you strength to stand up against the flesh. This is why church is so important. This is why gathering together with God's people is so important. And we encourage and we share with each other the things that we struggle with. And somebody else might have had that same struggle and help you to overcome that thing that you're struggling with. And you know, one thing I want to say is, you know, when you least feel like coming to church, sometimes that's the time when you need church most. Because if you think about it, if you give the flesh an inch, it's going to take a mile. If you think that, you know, you're struggling with walking in the spirit, you're struggling with some certain sin, and you don't feel like coming to church, the more you are away from church, the easier it's going to be to keep in that sin rather than coming to church and being reminded, being provoked, being, you know, uh, you know, sharpened. You know, the Bible talks about us edifying one another. It talks about us provoking on, uh, uh, one another unto love and good works. You know, it talks about us sharpening one another as a, as a man, uh, you know, sharpeneth the, counsel, uh, the countenance of his, of his friend. And we have that fellowship. There is that safety uh, in a multitude of counselors. So we see here the king of Israel, he goes and seeks counsel. And because of that, he gets some confidence, doesn't he? He goes to them and they tell him, you know, you know, basically, what are you doing? Don't hearken to him, hearken not unto him, nor consent. Basically saying, don't do what he's asking you to do. Now let's continue. It says here, Wherefore he said unto the messengers of Ben-Hadad, Tell my lord the king all that thou didst send for to thy servant. At the first I will do. But this thing I may not do. And the messengers departed and brought him word again. Now look at the reaction of Ben-Hadad to what uh, the king of Israel, Ahab, is saying. So he's basically saying, you know what? I'm going to do what I said the first. So he, he compromises, right? He doesn't just fully say no. He compromises and he says, you know what? What you first asked me to do, that I'm going to do. But I'm not just going to let your servants just come into my house and just take whatever they want. Now look at Ben-Hadad's reaction. And Ben-Hadad sent unto him and said, The gods do so unto me, and more also, if the dust of Samaria shall suffice for handfuls for all the people that follow me. So you see here, Ben-Hadad's not satisfied that he's just getting, you know, the first request. He's not satisfied. So even if you give in to the flesh and you say, well, you know what, I'm just going to compromise and do this, but no more. The flesh is not going to be satisfied with that. The flesh within you, the flesh will just eventually want more and more until it consumes you. Um, and, and that's why, why give up anything? You know, if, if that's what the flesh wants, why give up anything at all? You need to be ready for a fight. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it seems that when you want to try and take a stand, it's even more difficult, right? You know, if you try sometimes to, to stop something that you are addicted to or that you have just been doing, you know, day after day after day, um, you know, whatever that sin is for you, and I've already listed a few examples, when you try and stop, it's going to be difficult. And you just have to be ready for that um, because uh, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, it's not easy to go to war and to fight and to win. Um, but if you do give in, like we see here with Ben-Hadad, it's just going to keep wanting more. You're going to keep feeding that flesh. If you are addicted to pornography or you're addicted to a drug or you are lazy, if you keep giving into it, it'll just eventually overcome you even more and more. 
But you see here the king, you know, like we talked about, with the fellowship and with the strengthening in church. He's gone and received counsel. Now he has that safety, he has that support. He's got a bit of confidence now in verse 11. He says here, And king and the king of Israel answered and said, Tell him, let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself as he that putteth it off. So what is he saying here to Ben Hadid? He's basically saying, don't talk as though you've won the battle, even though you haven't even, you know, uh, you know, we haven't even started fighting yet, right? You haven't even put on your harness to go to war, and yet you're talking as though you've already won the war. And this is the attitude that we should have, right? We have to go to war against our flesh. We have to say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to give in to this fight. I'm not going to give in and just say, you know, throw my hands up and just say, oh, that's just how I am. And, you know, I can't do anything about it. We have to decide, you know what? Hey, don't let the flesh boast as though they're putting their harness off when the fight's only just beginning. You know, we have to be ready to fight. And it's going to be difficult. It's always easier to give in. But if you give in, the flesh is never satisfied. I want to show you this uh, verse in Ecclesiastes 5. Let's see if I can get here. No, it's not letting me go to individual verses. Verse uh, 10. Look at this verse. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. So this shows if somebody is, uh, you know, their sin might be they're just desiring riches and that's all they're living for, they're covetous. You know what? If that, that's all they want, they're never going to be satisfied because you, once you have a little bit, you know, you just want more. And when you get more, you just want even more. It just, it just never ends until you take a stand and just say, you know what, I haven't enough. And it's the same with the flesh. You know, the flesh always wants more. So why budge at all? Just take a stand now. Uh, let me go back uh, now to 1 Kings 20. Let's, uh, let's continue in this story. And it came to pass when Ben-Hadad heard this message as he was drinking, he and the kings and the pavilions, that he said unto his servants, Set yourselves in array. And they set themselves in array against the city. And behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou seen all this great multitude? And we'll find out later how much that is. And I think you'll be shocked. Uh, how many went against how many and how they won that battle. I will deliver it into thine hand this day and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Now, one thing I get from this verse is when you take a stand, when you decide to say, you know what, enough, I'm not serving the flesh anymore. You know, I'm going to give up this sin that I keep on doing. You have God on your side. God wants to support you in that endeavor. He wants you to stop in that sin. He wants you to stop, you know, fulfilling the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life and help you overcome if you are willing to fight that war. So we see here that God is on Ahab's side. Now Ahab wants to take a stand against Ben-Hadad and the Lord says to him, hey, you know what? There's this great multitude. It's going to look like a really hard battle that's ahead of you, but the Lord is on your side. And Ahab said, By whom? And he said, Thus saith the Lord, even by the young men of the princes of the provinces. Then he said, Who shall order the battle? And he answered, Thou. So you see what? God is going to give you the strength to overcome that sin. Um, just like here, he's with Ahab. Ahab's looking like, Is somebody else going to overcome it? Is somebody else going to fight this war? No, God says to him, You are the one that is going to be in charge of this battle. Then he numbered the young men of the princes of the provinces, and there were 232. And after them he numbered all the people, even all the children of Israel, being 7,000. So I'm not sure whether there's 7,232 in total, or whether it's 7,000 in total and included in there are the 232 uh, young princes. And they went out at noon, but Ben-Hadad was drinking himself drunk in the pavilions, he and the kings, the 30 and two kings that helped him. And the young men of the princes of the provinces went out first, and Ben-Hadad sent out, and they told him, saying, there are, men, there are men come out of Samaria. And he said, Whether they be come out for peace, take them alive, or whether they be come out for war, take them alive. So you see, Ben-Hadad is not really treating this, this, this war seriously, is he? And he sees this small multitude, about 7,000 people, come up against his army, and he, and he says, You know what? You know, whether they come to fight us or not, just make sure you, you take them alive. 
So these young men of the princes of the provinces came out of the city and the army which followed them. And they slew every one his man, and the Syrians fled, and Israel pursued them. And Behadad, the king of Israel, escaped on a horse with the horsemen. So they go to this battle, right, with a great multitude. We don't know yet at this point in the story how many are with the king of, of, of Syria, but we find out later on. They go to go up against the army of Israel, which is only 7,000 people, and they lose that battle because God is on their side. See, when you take a stand, God will help you to overcome that internal war that is going on inside of you. And you know what? If you take a stand against the flesh, or if you take a stand in anything to do you know, in the Christian life, look at what happens. He says here that the young men are going to deliver, are going to help him in that battle. So when you take a stand and you decide, you know what, I'm taking a stand for God, I'm going to be a good example, you will inspire the younger people in church and the younger believers to follow in your footsteps. You will be an inspiration to them. And, and look at what gets done. See, uh, the king of Israel, Ahab, is the, not the one that's killing everyone in the battle, right? As he inspires other people to join that battle and he's a good example to them, they, as a 7,000 strong army, then accomplish great things um, let's continue <clears throat> let's just see if I'm sort of skipping over anything here uh. ah yes I wanted to make this point as well is that when you make when you make a stand if you think about it in your Christian life it's not like this Wizard of Oz mentality, right? Wizard of Oz with, um, I can't remember what that lady was, you know, when she gets the red shoes and she's just like, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. That's not what taking a stand is. Like when you're trying to take a stand against your flesh, let's say you're struggling with some sort of sin. And, you know, I know with guys, you know, lust is a big one, right? Lust, you know, struggling with the lust of the flesh. The way you take a stand against that sin is not just, you know, in, in your mind, just say, I'm not going to think about pornography. I'm not going to lust in the flesh. That's not how you take a stand. How do you take a stand? Well, with here, it's not just uh, the king of Israel just saying, you know, oh, I'm just going to take a stand and not doing anything about it. No, God told him to go to war and that he's going to deliver that multitude into his hand and he obeyed the Lord. So in the Christian life, how do we take a stand? We don't just have this Wizard of Oz mentality that there's no place like home and you just try and fight it in your mind. No, you actually get busy. You get busy serving the Lord. You get busy in church. You get busy with your soul winning, with your prayer and your Bible reading. That's how you take a stand and that's how you inspire other people to take a stand as well. And, you know, we really need to consider our testimony. We need to consider how we look to other people and our impact to others in our church. Uh, so let's continue in this story. And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go, strengthen thyself and mark and see what thou doest. For at the return of the year, the king of Syria will come against thee. So what has happened here? They've, they've had this war. They've won the war. And then what happens? The prophet comes back to the king of Israel and says unto him, Go and strengthen thyself. Why? Because the king of Assyria is going to come and attack you again. Now, what can we learn from this in terms of the war in our spiritual life? You may have some victory. You may take a stand and overcome a sin in your life, but that's not the end, is it? That's not the end. Your flesh is going to come again and fight you again. And what should you be doing in the meantime? Should you be doing nothing? Should you just be celebrating and say, I didn't, I didn't do it this time and, and it's never going to happen again? No. In the meantime, you ought to be strengthening yourself. You, this, this should be a time now where you get even more into church. You get even more into soul winning, more into your Bible reading, that you strengthen your spiritual life because you know that temptation is going to come again. And when it comes the next time, you want to be ready because it's going to just keep coming. You know, like there's just going to be battle after battle after battle. And if you are not constantly strengthening yourself, walking in the spirit, getting that fellowship, being provoked unto love and good works, that's going to get weary. You're going to be wearied with that battle. And eventually you'll lose one of those battles. So it's not that God is saying here, hey, you've won this battle. Just take it easy. And when he comes again, you're just going to win it again. No, he's saying... You've won this battle, now go and strengthen yourself so that you're ready when they come up against you again. And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hill, therefore they, uh, they were stronger than we. 
But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And do this thing. Take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put captains in their rooms. And number thee an army like the army that thou hast lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariot. And we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And he hearkened unto their voice and did so. Um, and it came to pass at the return of the year that Ben-Hadad numbered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. And the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. But the Syrians filled the country. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said the Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So we see here that the Lord is still with the king of Israel and compared to the army of the Syrians, they're like two little flocks of kids, right? Two little um, flocks of, um, of lambs, of, 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 of baby goats. And they pitched one over against the other seven days. And so it was that in the seventh day, the battle was joined. And notice this, and the children of Israel slew of the Syrians an hundred thousand footmen in one day. Now, if you remember the battle before, you know how they, they went up 7,000 against the multitude. And remember when the Syrians came back to fight the king of Israel, remember the advisors said to the king of Syria, hey, just, just have the same size army, just chariot for chariot, horse to horse, but, but instead of the kings, put captains in their place. So this is the same size army that went against Israel in the beginning. So now you know what the numbers were. There were 7,000 versus 100,000, and they won that first battle. And then they came again with the same numbers, 100,000 in the valley against, and we're not told this time you know, what the numbers were in Israel, but you would think that it would be more because they were told to go and strengthen themselves uh, for the next battle. Um, and now they're fighting them in the valley. Now, one thing I wanted to note from just this story here is that when sin comes to you, your flesh comes to you to try and get you to do something wrong, uh, generally it's, it's the same thing, right? It's the same, you know, when you're struggling with a sin, it's the same temptation that is coming again, but sometimes it's just coming at a different angle, right? So it might this time, you know, uh, you know an example might be, that you know you're skipping church you know you're, you're, you're too busy in your life um, whether it's a you know it's a desire to be rich right and maybe you're you're working too hard or something like that um, you know or you're just too busy uh, you know with them trying to pull you away from serving the Lord pull you away from being amongst God's people and you know one tactic that the flesh might use is that it might you know use your family right your family might be one time trying to pull you away and then your flesh will then succumb to that uh, skipping church and whatnot. Um, and another time it might be your friends. Your friends one time might pull you away. But, you know, God forbid, it might be sometimes people that you know in church that are not necessarily encouraging you or people that you know online. But my point being is that the, the struggle is always the same. You know, there's not really that many tactics that the flesh uses. The flesh is always tempting you with the same thing, whatever you are struggling with in your, um, in your Christian walk. But sometimes it's just coming at different angles. And it's the same in this story here that we often struggle with the same things again and again and again. And it's not really anything different. But yet it's just coming at us from different areas of our life. Just here they fought in the hills, but now they're fighting in the valleys. And his servant said unto him, Behold, now we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel... Oh, sorry, I missed verse 30. 30. But the rest fled to Aphek into the city, and there a wall fell upon twenty and seven thousand of the men that were left. And Ben-Hadad fled and came into the city, into an inner chamber. So now they have won this great battle. They've won the first battle. They've strengthened themselves. They've now won this second battle. We find out there, there was a hundred thousand in the land, and then they went to the wall and killed t another twenty-seven thousand there. And now Ben-Hadad is, is running scared, right? He's running and he's cowering, and now he's trying to find mercy. And his servant said unto him, Behold, now we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let us, I pray thee, put sackcloth on our loins and ropes upon our heads and go out to the king of Israel 
peradventure he will save thy life. So they're now cowering in fear. They're trying to figure out, well, you know what? We've heard that the kings of Israel, you know, maybe if we just ask for forgiveness, we just ask for mercy, they're going to let us live. So they girded, the, uh, girded on their sackcloth, on their loins, and put ropes on their heads, and came to the king of Israel and said, Thy servant Ben-Hadad saith, I pray thee, let me live. And he said, Is he yet alive? He is my brother. And you kind of think, what, what, what is the king thinking here, right? Why, why, why after the, the, the Ben-Hadad has made war with him the first time, he's wanted to take all his goods, he's warred with him the second time, now he's asking for mercy, why is the king of Israel going soft? And you know, sometimes we get soft, right? We think, well, there's no big deal that the flesh wants to do this, that it wants me to do wrong. And we start making excuses rather than showing no mercy to our flesh as the king of Israel should not have shown mercy. Now the men did diligently observe whether anything would come from him and did hastily catch it. And they said, thy brother Ben-Hadad, yeah, thy brother, sure, you know, Ben-Hadad's your brother. Then he said, go ye, bring him. Then Ben-Hadad came forth to him and he caused him to come up into the chariot. And Ben-Hadad said unto him, the cities which my father took from thy father, I will restore and thou shalt make streets for thee in Damascus, as my father made in Samaria. Then said Ahab, I will send thee away with this covenant. So he made a covenant with him and sent him away. So what is the king of Israel doing here? So Ben-Hadad has asked for mercy. He has shown him mercy. He has not killed him. And then he's made a deal with him now saying, hey, you know, everything I took from you, I'm going to give back. And the king of Israel accepts this, uh, this offering and basically makes a promise with him um, and sends him away in peace. Now this is when we see the rebuke from the Lord, from a prophet to King Ahab. Verse 35. And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor in the word of the Lord, smite me, I pray thee. And the man refused to smite him. So this is a really sort of odd story where can, you can imagine if a prophet just came up to you and said, you know, in the word of the Lord, hit me. And the guy's like, I'm not, not going to hit you. Yeah. Well, look what happens in verse 36. Then said he unto him, Because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. So what's the lesson here? When God tells you to do something, you better do it. Now, you might not have a lion come after you and kill you, but there's going to be some sort of punishment. No matter how full, that's why it takes faith, because sometimes in our wisdom, it seems foolish to do what God tells us to do. But if God has, has commanded us to do it, we ought to do it. I mean, this prophet here is saying to the man next to him, you know, punch me in the face. And the guy's saying no, and he disobeys the Lord, and a lion comes and kill, kills him. Verse 37, then he found another man and said, smite me, I pray thee. And the man smote him so that in smiting, he wounded him. Now you're wondering, why is this prophet telling somebody to punch him in the face? Now we learn later on, because later on he goes basically to stay by the way, covers himself with ashes to disguise himself to King Ahab as though he's been in the war, right? As though he's been fighting. And that's why he's asking somebody to punch him in the face. So the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king, and he said, Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle, and behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me and said, Keep this man, if by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. So you see here, if you lose, you know, basically, I think what it's comparing here is if, if you do not refrain, if you do not sort of uh, keep what is entrusted to you in terms of this battle between the flesh and the spirit, it's going to cost you something, right? It's going to cost you, in this instant, his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent still. It's going to cost you uh, your possessions. So he's saying here to the king, and this actually, you know, didn't actually happen, but he's saying here that the story, like somebody told him to keep this man, and if he got away from him, then his life would be for his life. And as thy servant was busy here and there, he was gone. And the king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be, thyself hath decided it. And he hasted and took the ashes away from, away from his face 
and the king of Israel discerned him that he was of the prophets. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life and thy people for his people. And the king of Israel went to his house heavy and displeased and came to Samaria. So the lesson I want to take away from that in terms of the war with the spirit and the flesh is that if you make, if you try and compromise, right? If you make a deal with your flesh saying, you know what, I'm not going to just destroy you completely because you know the Bible says that through the spirit we ought to mortify the deeds of the flesh. We ought to have no part in the flesh whatsoever. But if you get to a point in your spiritual life where you just decide, you know what, I'm sinning in this area anyway, and you know what, I'm just going to let it pass. I'm just going to compromise. The flesh can have that, and then I'll, I'll just, uh, you know, I'll just work on other areas of my life. There's going to be a price to pay. You know, the Bible says here that, you know, life for life in this instance, but, you know, you could destroy your life by doing that. If you allow that little bit of sin to just take over your life, because remember when we talked about the sin, the, the, the flesh is not going to be happy just taking that little bit. It's going to want more and more and more. And if you compromise, you will end up losing that battle. You need to take a stand and fight against it and do not compromise in that area. Another thing I just want to talk about um, in this last bit that is not really so related, but one thing I sort of took from this passage that I wanted to share with you is, you know, we ought not to try and be more loving than God. You know, sometimes when we learn things in the Bible, we learn about the judgments of God. We learn about hell. We learn about capital punishment. We learn about the things that God hates. And sometimes we try and be more loving than God, don't we? You know, like people that don't, don't, aren't for capital punishment, they think, you know, we should just love everybody and there should be no judgment. Like, who are we to be more loving than God? In the sense that God wanted the king of Israel to destroy the king of, Assy uh, king of Syria and to destroy Ben-Hadad. But then the king of Israel, Ahab, he thought that he would do the merciful thing, right? And not destroy him, make a promise with him as long as he was, you know, uh, willing to give everything back. And he actually gets in trouble here from the Lord saying, why did you allow this man to live when I appointed him unto destruction? You know, we are not more loving than God. When God appoints somebody to destruction, that's it for them. You know, when people get sent to hell, it's, a, it's the same with hell. When people go to hell, that's it for them. There's no more hope. There's no more mercy. There's no more love from God. And, you know, who are we to try and be more loving than God? We just have to realize you know, we need to be saved. You know, we need to make sure that we're not going to hell. We need to make sure that people don't go to hell because once they're in hell, that's it. And people might say, you know, you know you're trying to scare people into going to heaven, but, you know, hell is a scary thing. You know, we ought to be scared of going to hell. But even so, we're not, we're not even, you know, asking that much. We're, we're not of the false religions that try and preach to people to do some impossible, impossible task in order to get to heaven, to keep works and try and work your way to heaven. I mean, we're just preaching, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's so easy to be saved. Why would anybody be upset with God that he is judging those uh, in hell and, 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 and they have to pay uh, for their sin? So when God does something right, you know, when we stand at the white throne judgment and we see people being thrown into hell, is it going to be, you know, what sort of mindset are we going to have? Are we going to say, you know, God shouldn't be doing this? You know, God is not merciful. No, we're going to be standing at the white throne judgment, seeing God throw people into the lake of fire. And we're going to say, amen. Right, because God's righteous, God's judgments are true and righteous. And when God judges people and condemns them to hell, who are we to try and be more loving than God? And it's kind of like in this instance, you know, God had appointed somebody to wrath, God had appointed somebody to judgment, and the king of Israel thought he could do something more loving by showing him mercy. So what's the point of this sermon? I mean, just to sort of get you familiar with 1 Kings 20, the story is kind of interesting there. We can learn a couple of parables with how we fight daily with our flesh and with our spirit. And a couple of takeaways are, you know, don't underestimate your flesh. Don't underestimate the war that you have to fight internally with your spirit and your flesh. And don't give in. 
You know, don't just think it's a small thing just to give in to the small sins because they'll grow into bigger and bigger sins. There is a spiritual war that's going on, not only with those that are unsaved and the enemies of God, but even within yourself. And if you don't win that battle, if you're not winning that battle, you're not going to be effective in the greater battle as well. So don't compromise. You know, take a stand. God is on your side when you try and stand up against your flesh. And you need to constantly be strengthening yourself. That's why it's so important to be amongst God's people. It's so important to take a stand. And what I mean by that is that you're doing the right thing, that you are purposely trying to walk in the flesh. You're purposely trying to learn more about God, learn more about Jesus, get in your Bible, reading your Bible, hanging around with God's people, because that's how you're going to take a stand and strengthen yourself against the constant battle that you're going to face um, day in and day out. Anyways, I hope that was a blessing for you. I hope that was, you know, just a reminder for you to take that stand. Um, but, uh, you know, let's, let's keep fighting. Let's help one another. You know, you need this church. You need to be in church. But I need it just as much as you do. Do you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not above the flesh. I'm not, I'm not above sin. You know, this church is just as important for you as it is for me. And that's why we all need to be in on this. And we all need to uh, help one another and encourage one another because you're not going to get it out there. Do you know what I mean? If, if, you're, if, if, you, don't, if you don't come to church and get in ch encouraged to serve the Lord, you're not going to find it anywhere else. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, um, for this uh, story. Thank you for, um, you know, that we can uh, learn some, some sort of uh, parallels to it. Um, help us, Lord, to take a stand. You know, uh, the, the multitude might be great, but Lord, we know you're on our side. We know that you want to help us to overcome sin. And Lord, help us to, to make that stand and to fight the good fight of faith, uh, not only uh, in, our, in, in, in the world, Lord, but also uh, within us. Help us, Lord, um, to overcome any sin that we're struggling with. Help us, Lord, to be a blessing to one another. Help us to provoke and encourage one another into love and good works. And uh, we just thank you, Lord, um, for helping us to grow and uh, helping us to learn more. We praise you uh, in Jesus' name. Amen.